we are one of the very few companies in the market who actually use psychology and this approach to understand gamers and their psychology and their behavior in the game and then uh, use this data to improve their uh, experience. If men are from Planet PC and women from Planet Console, who's from Planet Mobile? Hello and welcome to Growth Masterminds. My name, of course, is John here. Globally, we know that at least 3.2 billion people play games on PC, console, mobile, and other platforms. But it turns out that there might be some different patterns of play between men versus women, or on different geos, or using different platforms. GameTree is an LFG looking for group app that has built a proprietary gamer DNA tool. Thanks to a global panel of hundreds of thousands of gamers that has facilitated millions of gamer connections. And we're going to find out what they can tell us. To chat, we have GameTree founder Dana Sidorenko and John Yuke. Welcome, both of you. Hey. Hello, hello. Yeah, thanks Super for having Super to have you, John. You're coming to us. You're pretty close, actually. You're in Vegas. It's like three, four hours away from me. I'm in Vancouver. And Dana, you are in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So it's late for you. Thank you for joining us. Really do appreciate it. Sure. You guys looked at PC gaming, mobile gaming, console, Switch, everything. What did you learn? Oh, I don't even know where to start. It's actually a lot of different things. And uh, something super cool that you mentioned is difference between like female and male, because a lot of people still think that male play more games, but that's actually... Uh, not 100% true. It's just uh, the way how people play and each, a each age and each country is very uh, depend on. For example, according to Game Tree data and Game Tree, because the way how the platform design uh, looks super deep into gaming, into looks super deep into gamers, their preferences, their behavior, we collect tons of data on our users and in each individual as well. So we see clearly that um, like female uh, play a lot up from 16 to somewhere around like 30. There's almost no significant difference between proportion men and women who uh, say that they play games. But as we get older, somewhere around like 32, we see big difference and this big difference increasing. Uh, so men keep playing more games and women start playing less. And it makes sense because, you know, still in a lot of countries, society kind of expect, and that's very common, that women more um, start paying more attention to like kids and uh, other stuff versus men. If they gamers, they keep playing. Um, so this is one of the big trends that we see very clearly. And also it depends on the countries, mm -hmm. um, game genres very different for for different um for different genders john when you yeah. looked at all the data and the reports what stood out to you uh so men play pc more uh, on computers and women actually play on playstation a lot more than men which <laughs> you'd think that playstation it's kind of like dark it has sort of a hardcore vibe to it uh but when you think about it uh certain things like um a lot of the kind of like anime type games, adventure games, things like that are actually on PlayStation. So that's actually the one that has the biggest difference where women are playing the most. Super interesting. I mean, when you think PC and you think console, you think fairly hardcore games, you think really intense, deep, uh, high levels of graphics. Is that accurate? I mean, you mentioned there's some more, you know, kind of fluffy games on on, on PlayStation. And you I, you even looked at Wii, I mean, which is a dead platform in, in a lot of sense, but a lot of people still have it and still play it occasionally. Is that perception of PC gaming and console gaming incorrect? The Wii is very popular because the price point is great. Like, especially, for example, in Africa, it's just proportionately popular. Um, but when it comes to the different aesthetics that people like, um, women care more about like casual and also music and party games. Uh, something interesting as well is like the other category, which is like, for example, trans um, care about music and party, but not casual as much. Uh, so that was an interesting thing to note a difference in the data. Uh, then when it comes to what is the sports games and action, men tend to score higher. 
And then we actually have the gamer DNA that you mentioned, which is a test we developed that measures different aesthetics of fun. It's a better way to actually categorize fun by the types of fun rather than by genres. Uh, for example, an RPG could be about um, like the graphics, or it could be about the social layer, or it could be about achievement or story. It's such a broad genre that it almost is meaningless to say something's an RPG. What's more interesting to look at is the aesthetics. And this was built from the aesthetics of play model that we found to be missing a lot of stuff. So we added a lot more aesthetics. When it comes to that, we find um, men care more about difficulty uh, is one that stands out. Uh, so men like to like throw themselves at the wall and like fail more often and like hit their heads a lot more. Um, women care more about graphics, for example. Um, and also another one is achievement that women score higher on. Wow, John, I just learned I'm a woman. Um... <laughs> The dog for, me, <laughs> for me, gaming is like, give me three minutes of fun. Give me three minutes of a break. And let, you know, I, I, I don't want to do something that is crazy, insane hard and have to do it like 25 times to beat the level or something like that. I, I want some fun right now. I want to win in some tiny little area of my life while I'm failing massively everywhere else. Well, <laughs> so, yeah. But you know one. that. That's one of the reasons why um, John mentioned gamer DNA. We think that each individual has very unique gamer style and game studio uh, do not spend enough time um, analyze user behavior in the game and categorize it. Like we are one of the very few companies in the market who actually use psychology and this approach to understand gamers and their psychology and their behavior in the game, and then uh, use this data to improve their uh, experience and especially social experience, because as we believe, social element is crucial for online gaming. And it's become not about game by itself, but about people who you're playing with. Hmm. John, maybe unpack this idea of gamer DNA a little bit. What factors or what are, what are you looking at there? What are you scoring people on? Yes. So essentially, uh, we go through, we've looked at other models and just didn't like exactly what we saw and how things were categorized and expanded things a bit. For example, there's just different types of fun that everybody has a different blueprint of. An easy example that most people can agree with, for example, Dungeons and Dragons. On one side, you have like power gamers and on the other, you have like actors and like more casual people. And even though it's the same game, there's no right or wrong way to play. But if you mix them together, they're going to like hate each other and find each other toxic and not have fun. And that's actually surprisingly a big insight we've had as the biggest source of toxicity in gaming now. It's not like anonymity. It's not trolling. A lot of it is somebody just having a bad day. But honestly, it's just the wrong people playing together. In the past, you'd play with friends or you'd play in a server where you get to know people and you kind of find the right vibe for you. But now if you have like a casual person and a competitive person, even if they're the same skill level, they're going to be like, oh, like F you, like I'm just trying to have fun. The other person's like, oh, you're not trying hard enough, like blah, blah, blah. And they just fight when uh, it's kind of like real life, like we kind of naturally find our tribes. But in gaming with instant queue matchmaking, it just made it easier to just click a button and play with random strangers which unfortunately made other parts of the experience worse. Dana, that's super interesting because I had to look up LFG. Um, I, I checked your website and it says Game Tree is an LFG app. And I'm going like, what the heck is LFG? The only thing I know about LFG is let's F and go, right? And I thought, <laughs> no, that can't be the <laughs> right? Can anyone what say? Read that, um, to that version. <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh, it's a tinder version of the gamer i don't know whatever anyways but looking for group that makes a ton of sense so you're kind of categorizing people what are you trying to get out of your gaming experience and you're matching them up to play together does that result in a lot less conflict it's um a yes it's um proof that toxicity level decreases uh if you know person who you play with and if it's not random people but it's somebody who you actually going to be real life friends and also another part that very big and missing it's values so it open up bigger question how are we choosing who going to be our friend because in real life it's not happening that you on the street meet your best 
friend. You know, there's usually some third event that's coming into your life and somebody's life and kind of unite you together into somebody, in, in, into your friendship. So if you'll think about your friends through your life, how you become a friend, it's going to be around something. It's going to be like some event or some activity that bring you both together. And games in this way, it's a perfect uh, tool. Because game, the idea of game, the way how they create it and design, it's perfect tool to actually create very strong bond and very strong friendship. So now we're going to next level that games, it's not just for fun or like mm, spending time. Yes, but also more because also it can be a very powerful door to meet friends, to build very strong connections. And for a lot of people nowadays, uh, loneliness, it's a big thing that going on with the especially younger generation, especially gamers, that they not have that big of a social group. They spend majority of their time by themselves, like suicide la- level, depression level, and all of that had direct relationship to our how socially active we are, how big our social group, et cetera, et cetera, how accepted we by our social group. And... um that's what game tree is about. Cool. Yeah, we cool. find that gaming is more fun when you're playing with people you care about. If something cool happens, it becomes a story. It's not just some wasted moment that disappears into the void. It also makes it more meaningful because you're actually building relationships and hanging out. It's not just like time wasting. So a lot of this is a love letter to making gaming more fun and meaningful and allowing people to play more games and have more productivity out of it. Where otherwise a lot of people are like, oh, I'm 30 now. I need to stop, for example. There are some crazy stories out there of gamer groups who sort of got connected at random or on some platform 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and they're still gaming together and they meet up. And some I, I've read some of them in the past few months. And the first time they saw each other in person was for the funeral of one of their members or something like that, right? And really, really interesting. I want to dig a little deeper into this gamer DNA stuff. And so I'm going to list some of the characteristics that you guys look at, and then I'm going to ask you for some of the differences. One of the reasons I'm interested in this is because I've been talking to people like at data.ai and other analytics companies, and many of them are starting to characterize and categorize games as types of games by looking deeper than what the game name is, what genre they've decided to post it in on whatever platform or app store it's on and, or whatever description they've given, but what elements are there. And and this is interesting. When I look at what you're looking at for people, you're looking at mechanical skills, like how you're looking at complexity, you're looking at graphics, status, are you building status, not building difficulty level? Is it easy to get into? Is it hard to get into? Critical thinking, grinding. Oh, that's our favorite part. Yeah. Exploration. Some people really love that, that open world. I'm going to go find everything, tap on everything. Does this do something? Does that do something? I hate that. Can you tell? Uh, teamwork. You want to work with other people. Achievement, artistic, creativity, characters, agency. What can you do, not do? Excitement, practice, role play, dominance. That's interesting. Sound and love. Those are some of the things you guys look at for your gamer DNA. Uh, John, what did what did men score higher on? What are they more interested in generally? So men score a little bit more mechanical skills, um, complexity, uh, status, ironically, because usually you think of women as being more status conscious, but they actually score a bit higher in gaming, at least. Um, men also surprisingly score a little bit higher on socializing, uh, quite a bit higher in difficulty is the biggest difference. Uh, and a couple more breaking all out. the norms right now. <laughs> yeah, a couple more that stand out are excitement and dominance. Uh, dominance is essentially not as much like competition, but it's the feeling of being better than others. For example, one of the questions we ask is like, "Do you like poning noobs?" Which is like, destroying <laughs> people who are way weaker than you. And women are like less likely to be into that compared to men. Thank you, women. Thank you, women. We appreciate you. Because- because women experience that the most, especially when you like just get into gaming, amount of uh, criticism that you hear about your uh, skill and your gender is <laughs> enormously uh, huge. 
Yeah, yeah. and it's also yeah. secretly like a little. What that one's a little bit of a toxicity flag because, like, you oh, know, everybody really? has dominance, but somebody who's has dominance is more likely to make a negative play experience. Yeah, in some yeah. it's not yeah. that fun. The guy way. who's running into a wall continuously and shoot him in the back of the head. I get it, absolutely. Dana, what did women rank a little higher in? Uh, okay, let me open the data. I have it open, but it's basically the inverse. But the things that stand out um, are uh, graphics. Um, achievement, artistic creativity. They care more about the characters and also role playing. Dana, maybe let's come to you on the next question then. Uh, you guys have looked at a lot of PC and you've looked at a lot of uh, console. You're also looking at mobile. How does that fit? Is that a more egalitarian platform? Is that, does it, that kind of level things out? Or is that, does that also follow some different patterns with regard to gender or geo or other things like that? So um, it's not a secret that mobile games is super popular. But the reason why it's popular, it's not because um, of mobile games, but because mobile phone and smartphone is the device that everybody has to set up like gamer PC or to even have PlayStation and different uh, devices require quite um, some effort, but smartphone is very uh, available. So also depends on the uh, gender. There is some preferences and these preferences it's about expectation. So, for example, games that we play on the PC, we have quite higher expectation almost on everything versus games that we play on the smartphone. And we do see a big trend on like increasing uh, mobile gaming right now. But also, um, this is um, something that we see big difference, like you know, in terms of graphic quality. So. For a smart one, you almost do not have any expectation. In our data, about like 22% of responders said that they expect some um, some uh, good graphic uh, gra good graphic on the smartphone. And the same with like audio and sound sound effects. Only like 35% of gamers they say that they are uh, interested to have it high quality. Uh, versus with the PC gamers, they have much higher standards for, for everything. And uh, it's still open question, can we call somebody who play on the mobile a gamer? Is it really? I thought that we were kind of settling on yes for that. I don't, I don't know. What, what's, what's your thinking, Dana? Well, if you ask somebody who work professional gaming, of course, because, you know, users just the users. But if you ask me as a gamer, <laughs> Whoa, let's talk about that. I think Dana is one of those people who hunts noobs, uh, <laughs> who shoots them in the back of the head. She sounds that, that way to me, John. I about, don't know. About 82% of, of gamers, they play on everything. Like they play on mobile and they also play on something else. So mm -hmm. if you play on a, a desktop and a console, you definitely play on mobile. But if you play only on mobile, you're probably not that dedicated to gaming world. <laughs> That's probably true. And yet mobile is where most of the profit is, where most of the money is, right? It's about but, mo but mobile gaming, they have uh, usually different model of monetization. So mobile gaming, they usually monetize and very different business model versus mm -hmm. uh, PC games or yeah. um, PlayStation. So... In terms of value, uh, volume, yes. In terms of revenue, uh, not always. Okay, not always. I see. Gross versus net revenue is what you're talking about. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, like revenue per user and um, revenue for, for game studios. Something I'd also like to point out is um, we have the gamer DNA model, but we also have a personal values test and a personality psychology test. And so those have correlations uh, with who becomes friends what kind of games people enjoy. And then there's also kind of data when you look at, at aggregate, you can kind of tell by the people who like a game, the thing about the game itself. Like we measured the DNA of the players, but based on the people who like a game, it also gives the DNA of the game itself. For example, there was a big battle between League of Legends and Dota, which one requires more skill. It's mostly settled now, it's Dota. But if you look at game tree data, you can see that people who play Dota have higher difficulty scores on what they like. So it basically mathematically proves that Dota is the more difficult game. 
let's talk about that because that's super interesting because you built what you built for gamer dna and game tree the service to match up different players with with each other that's awesome that's cool but it sounds like you've built a really interesting resource for people to understand what is really the driving factor behind making a game successful or not successful or who it should be attracting, who they should be marketing to. That sounds like a really valuable resource for game publishers and game developers and designers to check out. A public company reached out wanting to acquire GameTree and said that they spent seven months studying the market and think that GameTree is collecting the most data in the world on individual gamers. And it wasn't our original intention. It's just that when you're matching people, the more data you have, the better you can match. And as a user, you're like, okay, I'm willing to do some data entry if it's fun. And also if it makes the difference between some little kid screaming at me, telling me to kill myself and like meeting my next best friend. So game tree doesn't just match by the play style, but actually the most important thing is actually personal values. It's if you can morally accept somebody as a good person. And there's actually uh, just a lot of correlations between certain values that we know are bigger predictive predictors of who becomes friends, for example on like Facebook or Steam after meeting Game Tree. And then when it comes to this data and the industry, the film industry, I think everybody knows now, does a lot of data-driven production uh, about like who they cast, what they're even gonna make, who they're gonna show it to. And even though the gaming industry is much bigger now, it's a little less mature in that area, um, but it's starting to get there where it's becoming a more data-driven process where they, for example, are making games and finding out who the audiences are or just making lots of games to, because they know they have a certain audience and then trying to fit games into that audience and test those. We also very, uh, in, like we encourage game studios and game publisher to reach out to us and we'll be happy to collab and um, share what insight we have, what we learn through our journey to improve gaming industry and to improve um, games. Okay, I want to hit a couple more things. I want to hit cross-platform. I want to talk about VR. And I know Dana wants to talk about women in gaming. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about cross-platform for a moment. Uh, you're looking yeah. at a lot of different platforms. I'm not sure if you're looking at each individual one. But what we're seeing is more and more cross-platform play for a lot of reasons. You want to get a little hit while you're on mobile. You know, you're on, you know it's going to be desktop or PC when you get back home. Or... A company is really investing in their in their web um, PC uh, game or application so that they can get payments there and not take them on an app store and pay 30%. Other things going on there. Anything that you've learned there? Something super cool. And uh, again, maybe not very expectable, but um, different countries, they actually have different preferences on devices that they use for, for gaming. And for some countries, uh, you know, like this uh, map of Europe, when they separate like, oh, a tomato Europe and potato Europe, we can create some sort of map like this for a world where it's like, oh, this is more PC gamers. This is more like PlayStation gamers. And this is more like console gaming uh, gamers. Uh, but cross platforms, it's a trend that was around for, for a while and I think this one of the things that goes uh, that benefit a studio and also users as well. There's a trend as well, which ties into VR. Uh, in VR, it's become known that the reason that hasn't been taking off is because the people who want it the most are the people who can afford it the least. It's the younger generation that wants it and it's expensive. And the older gamers are like, oh, this makes me sick. I'm not going to touch this. It's, it's slowly changing. Um, but that compounds with a trend in society where older people have more money and younger people have less money over time. Uh, the wealth dis distance has been growing as quite a chasm. Uh, so for that reason, there, that's, for example, why the Wii has sold more than the other consoles combined is because it's more affordable, easier to run. So there's a big trend. Uh, and also like Dana was talking about with mobile. About, uh, in our statistic, about eight percent of gamers actually uh, play on VR and we do believe that technology wasn't there so if you had this experience and you played in VR yeah it's a whole new level but your brain like um, gets sick and you physically get sick so a lot of gamers wouldn't able to sacrifice their uh, well-being for for gaming as technology developing, we do expect, especially nowadays, that um, it's going to be big trend and 
growing trend. Even last year, um, on GDC and in different uh, entertainment uh, conferences, VR take a big part of agenda. I think this is a big thing. Yeah, I'm certainly seeing some interesting things um, on Apple Vision Pro, even though it's super, super, super early. And uh, just the clarity and the, the quality of the experience is incredible. But to John's point, $3,500 US, yeah, uh, it's a yeah. little much. Of course, there's cheaper options, uh, but they have their own challenges as well. I'd also like to touch on uh, Web3 while we're at it, um, blockchain gaming. Um, as most people know, it's kind of annoying in the game front very good. Um, but as an insider in the industry, we're seeing a lot more good games and development that'll be coming out over the next year. Like a lot of us are looking to play games. So while we don't believe it's ever going to be like majority of the market, it's going to be a niche. Um, the quality of that niche looks like it, it's going quite well. And there are certain genres that, that play well to that web three element where it actually makes the games more fun or more interesting. It's just, you know, people who like economies and trading and uh, collectibles and things. You'll have to add that into the gamer DNA, right? Like money or collecting or something like that, other things like that. I can totally see that. And I can totally see that as something that'll be interesting for large publishers, large studios that have many games and they want to have some level of loose connectivity uh, of status or ownership or transferability between those so that when, you know, you're tired of one game, hey, there's another game you can jump into and you're not, you know, zero, level zero uh, off the bat. You can you can jump a few levels. That makes some sense. You did mention a few things off the top, Dana, on women in gaming. And I didn't totally know where you're going with that, but I thought, hey, let's let's open that topic and 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 give you your form. So uh, I had this conversation way too often, especially with the men. Um, like, is it actually worth to support a woman in games movement? Movement, and like, why should we care? Especially around esport, and this is really open question. Um, John, what is your opinion about that? If you press me. In this moment, what I would say is that we know that many more women are gamers than we would have previously expected in, let's say, an era 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when it was desktop and, and console, pretty much. And we know that women game on their on their mobile devices, and I do call them gamers if they play games. Sorry, maybe that a, a purist would get offended. You know, I, it's just as much as men do, in some cases more. Um, I, so I have, I, I think that's a wonderful thing. I think it's a great thing. I don't know what it means exactly in terms of where you're going with, you know, supporting women in gaming. I think we need to do that. Obviously, there's been things like Gamergate, which has been bad, horrible, and awful. Uh, John's talked about toxicity in gaming, and we know that um, gamers with a female name or an avatar can tend to get picked on or critiqued or abused more than others and we also know talking about vr there's been research on that that if you have a female vr then there's i don't know what they call it there's almost this sort of virtual rape experience or invading personal space experience that has happened in some vr systems and and games and, and environments so i think there's some interesting things to talk about there but i'm asking you the question that's the benefit of being the host so it is true that women used to play less and if we look even deeper why women was uh, playing less and answer is very simple because majority of game developer and especially earlier on it was men who created games the way how they would want it to play and of course men audience was more open to enjoy it and um and then a whole this loop started like if men create games that other men like more over time, men is the only one who play games. So for studios, make no sense target women because men's the main audience. So they started targeting men and then more men get acquired and women kind of left uh, aside of all of this. And for studios was like, why would we create more games for girls if they don't play anyway? And all this thing started changing very recently. We do see uh, a big movements from uh, from game studio, for example, Riot is uh, very strong on that to empower women developers. And 
of course, women developers would create uh, games that would show a woman perspective. Because very often, if we talk about equality, if we talk about creating games that will be equally enjoyable for men and women, it's still, when it's created by men, uh, brain, it still somehow uh, make it about men. And um, it should be collaboration of all genders working together. And every gamer, uh, regardless of his orientation or um, gender, should find a character or element of the game that he would uh, feel related to. So that's one of the things why it's very, uh, in my opinion, um, it's not realistic to expect that things going to be equal by themselves, especially if we talk about professional esports, um, competitive gaming. Things not going to change by itself if we're not going to talk about this as we're doing right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> and as we're going to pay attention to that. Yeah. Also, I so much matters about identity with heroes and such. Like, Dana said, if the first games are targeted toward the men, uh, just like with movies or careers or things like that, it's finally starting to change, which benefits everybody. Because we have, for example, if we have more talented women in the industry, then we get better games. And luckily that is changing, but it's taking a long time. But also it trickles upwards. For example, most of the executives are men because they were longer in the industry disproportionately. But as time as it goes on, there'll be more executive women, they'll green light more games and such. Makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Love it. Guys, thank you so much for taking this time, especially Dana. I, what time is it locally for you? It's almost 2 a.m. Oh, please ask for a different time next. That's horrible. That's off. I feel awful. No, um, honestly, uh, I, I enjoy our conversation. The energy and dynamic keep me up. No worries. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. Really do appreciate it. John, good to chat with you again. Thank you both. Yeah, th thanks for having us. It's been fun.